basically a question answer because we will have the uh, Mentimeter questions uh, just after this introduction uh, to get a bit of a feeling uh, of what uh, of who you are and, and, and what you know about Horizon Europe. Um, now, this uh, workshop is organized by the Open Air Community of Practice of uh, Training, uh, Open Science Training Coordinators. And this group exists since uh, 2008 up. Uh, 2018, so it has been set up uh, in that time uh, by uh, the Open Air community, but by now many, many people have joined us uh, from uh, different projects, different initiatives, uh, all together working on open science training. And uh, we had uh, monthly meetings uh, throughout the years with a lot of notes and a lot of exchange of uh, knowledge and practices. It's a really rich community. Uh, I must say. Uh, more than 20 countries are represented in that community of practice and uh, in this open science where we have three workshops. Um, not only do we exchange experiences but we work together on, on different uh, documents on di different initiatives together. Um, here are some examples, for example there was a workshop report on training in the European Open Science Cloud and uh, several members of our community uh, were part of the EOS working group on skills and training and worked on the work, uh, working group report uh, with uh, nice recommendations coming out. We also try to capture um, what our community is doing with those recommendations, so we have a mapping of um, member activities on, uh, on all these fronts. So, uh, it is important for us uh, to, to do this and uh, to work together and sharing, collaborating, contributing and coordinating. Uh, that is what we do in this community of practice. You see the link up there uh, if you want to know more or if you want to join us, openair.eu uh, slash COP dash training. Uh, so we are always uh, looking forward to meeting new people and to engage with new people uh, in open science training. Today, uh, we have a program on Horizon uh, Europe uh, Open Science uh, Regulations. Um, and as said, uh, we will first do a few Menti uh, questions to know who you are. So I will stop sharing my screen and bank up where maybe you can start the Menti meter. And I'll let you drive it. Uh, so we have, uh, so you go to, to menti.com and then enter the code 85484402, or you can use the QR code to, uh, to do this on your, on your smartphone. Uh, so let uh, us see uh, who's coming in. Uh, can you go back to the code again for just to make sure, uh, Venkat? I lost the code. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, it's not making no it online. It's, all, it's already going. No problem. <laughs> uh, let's put the Manti code into the chat. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. I see that. 22 people have already uh, voted here. I'll give it a few more minutes. Uh, so that we see who's in, in the audience, who's taking uh, part in this, in this workshop. Um, I see... Uh, many librarians, some data stewards, uh, two researchers, and uh, a lot of other research support, probably in uh, uh, research offices and things like that in uh, universities and research institutions, and yeah, all that kind of research support. Okay, uh, let's maybe move to, to the next question, uh, Venkat. Are you already a member of this community of practice? Uh, so that you know if you already know it or not. Hmm. Yeah, so I see that uh, 
there are many that are not a member of the community of practice, which is of course very fine, but now you get to know us, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, okay, um, I see that it stopped in yeah, 38 by now. Okay, maybe let's move to the next question, which is more uh, a question regarding the subject of today. And that's if you are uh, familiar with the open science requirements in, uh, in Horizon Europe. So uh, we, we will do an introduction on the open science requirements, of course, for some of you, this will, uh, will, we will repeat uh, things that you already know. But for some of you, this, uh, this will be new. Okay, and uh, what do you think about them? So, uh, nine. So, the majority already knows uh, knows the open science uh, requirements in Horizon Europe, and of course this is a yes no question. Um, but do you think they are easy and difficult to comply with, uh, or do you think your research you find them easy or difficult to comply with? It's actually not a question. The question here is, do you think do you think that they are easy or difficult to comply with? Maybe not easy to answer as a yes no question. So. Where on the gray scale are you? More to yes or not, more to uh, difficult side of things. So it's, we can see a bit more of uh, difficulty to comply with these. Um, with these requirements. And that is why we organize a workshop like this, of course, to make it easier for all of us to support our community in complying with these open science requirements. Let me keep track of time. Okay, let's give it a, a half a minute or so. But I don't see any more answers coming in. Okay, so now we, we all have uh, a feeling of uh, who you are and, and how familiar you are with the open science requirements and what you think of them. So uh, let's dive into uh, let's dive into the open science requirements in Horizon Europe. And for that, we asked uh, for some help from the open science team in the European Commission and from the ERC. And uh, that's why we will start with Alia uh, Gomez, who will uh, tell us more uh, about the open science requirements uh, at all stages in uh, Horizon Europe proposals and uh, projects. So Alia, you can share the screen and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. you yes, good morning minutes. everyone. And thank you very much, Inga. So very happy to see that so many people are already familiar with the requirements. Uh, I come from the Open Science Unit in the Director General from Research and Innovation. I'm also very happy to see familiar faces within the participants and also that my some of my colleagues are here. Victoria, that will be also participated in the breakout session. Carlos Casaran, I think he's also here. And Dagmar, of course, that she will be presenting afterwards. It, it was not unclear to me whether it was easy or difficult. The people that uh, participants were finding that uh, to comply with our requirements, I took it as the majority finding it easy. But okay, let's go through it and see. So I'm going to share the screen now. Uh, So I understand you can see my screen? Yes, we can okay. see. So let's go straight to the point. What are the main novelties in Horizon Europe? Uh, first, the rationale and scope. We are moving from open access, of course, still having open access as a core element in our open science policy and requirements, to the broader concept of open science with a broader scope of policy. And open science comprises different open science practices. 
Then another main novelty in Horizon Europe is the evaluation of proposals. Open science is evaluated under excellence, not impact. And the practices beyond those that are mandatory, I will later elaborate on the difference between mandatory and recommended open science practices, are incentivized through the evaluation. Publications, very importantly, will be evaluated on the basis of a qualitative assessment provided and not per the journal impact factor. This is a big step forward, I would say, in promoting the change in the research assessment system that we all know is so much needed. Also, another novelty regards intellectual property rights, the requirement to maintain enough rights, enough IPRs, to meet open access requirements uh, for publications. Another one is uh, immediate open access. This is a very well-known novelty in Horizon Europe. We no longer accept embargo periods and only publication fees in full open access venues are reimbursable. So no reimbursement of publication fees in hybrid venues. Another novelty with regard to research data is that the focus goes to, maybe I can close this, uh, goes to the broader concept of research data management. Research data management becomes mandatory for all projects that generate and or reuse data. Research data management includes data management plans and open access to research data still follows the principle as open as possible, as closed as necessary, which allows for a certain set of exceptions to the openness of research data. Then we also have a qualified open access to research outputs with a specific licenses and technical standards for digital objects to enable fair, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable and the concept of trusted repositories that I will later present. Also the focus on the reproducibility of research through a requirement to provide information for the validation of publications and the validation and reuse of research data. And also with certain provisions on access for validation of publications uh, while legitimate interests are safeguarded. And um, also the open science and public emergencies provisions with immediate open access to all research outputs and exclusive licenses under fair and reasonable conditions to the relevant entities that need to address those public emergencies if open access is not possible. But I will uh, cover all this now in the next slide. So this is just for you to have an overview of which are the main novelties in Horizon Europe in comparison with um, Horizon 2020 provisions. So a very important aspect in Horizon Europe and in the open science practices is the evaluation of proposals and open science. Open science will be evaluated under the excellence criterion and under the quality and efficiency of implementation criterion. So under the excellence criterion, open science uh, practices are part of the evaluation of the methodology and evaluation of the quality of open science practices with one page to describe more or less open science practices and one page to describe research data and research output management. So not only research data, but also research output management. This is not the DMP, the data management plan that, that is a deliverable per uh, month six, but is one page to describe research data and output management. And on, uh, with regard to the quality and efficiency of implementation criterion, the capacity of participants and consortium as a whole and the list of achievements. The proposers will have to explain the expertise on open science and include a list of publications, software, data relevant to the project with a qualitative assessment and where available persistent identifiers. Importantly, publications are expected to be open access. Those publications that figure in the list of publications are expected to be open access data sets are expected to be fair and as open as possible, as close as necessary, so open access unless some exceptions duly justify that they are closed, and the significance of publications is to be evaluated on the basis of the proposer's qualitative assessment and not per the journal impact factor. We have made a difference in Horizon Europe between two sets of uh, open science practices the mandatory open science practices, those are the open science practices that I will present and that are part of the model grant agreement, the Horizon Europe model grant agreement in which we can find the obligations for our beneficiaries. 
and the recommended mandatory open science practices. Here you can see an overview of some recommended uh, open science practices, but of course this is a non-exhaustive list. We can say that all open science practices which are not mandatory are recommended. And how do we incentivize the adoption or the practice of such open science practices? via the evaluation of proposals, because they will be positively evaluated when duly addressed in the proposal. Here you have some examples, and then you will see the link to the Horizon Europe Program Guide, which is a document provided guidance uh, that we prepared with a focus and with a view in helping at the proposal and evaluation stage. So their proposers will have, have already, because it's already publicly available on our website, more information on how to integrate those open science practices, mandatory, but the recommended one and with more information on the recommended one at the proposal stage and how they will be taken into account. Just another bene on evaluation. As I mentioned, evaluation concerns the mandatory and the recommended open science practices. The latter were appropriate. Um, open science practices can be duly justified as not appropriate for the project. And then the score is not lower for not addressing those practices or for a lack of open science expertise. But very important to note, it has to be duly justified that those are not appropriate for the project. And all work programs, except for the ERC, evaluate open science practices as outlined above under the excellence and quality and efficiency of implementation criteria, with the exception uh, of some EIC programs that for now, because that will change, uh, evaluate under impact. As of 2022, they will do so under excellence. So that was just an overview a little touch on the evaluation of proposals and how open science practices are integrated into the evaluation. Uh, there is a later on a breakout session on the evaluation in which my colleague Victoria Tsukala will be present. So there uh, you will also be able to tackle that into more detail. And now let's go into the model grant agreement, the Horizon Europe model grant agreement requirements. So those are the mandatory open science practices. And we can divide those in three main broad categories. The obligations with regard to open access to scientific publications, the obligations with regard to research data management, and the obligations with regard to what we call additional open science practices. So beyond open access to scientific publications and research data management. With regard to open access to scientific publications, our beneficiaries must ensure open access to peer-reviewed scientific publications relating to the result. In particular, they must ensure that at the latest step of publication, this is what we understand by immediate, at the latest step of publication, the position of either the author accepted manuscript after peer review or the version of record in a trusted repository and immediate open access via the repository under a CC BY, a Creative Commons Attribution License or an equivalent license. And we allow a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial CC BY NC or CC by ND, or the combination of the two non-derivatives for long text formats. What is important here, we are moving to the requirement of immediate open access, no longer embargo periods accepted, as we have always had the requirement to provide, to deposit and provide that open access via the repository. That has always been a key element of our open access policy in our framework programs for research and innovation. No matter the publication venue, even if our beneficiaries are publishing in a full open access venue, they will have to deposit and provide open access via repository in order to satisfy our requirements. And then, very importantly, the requirement to apply open licenses, CC BY for publications or equivalent CC BY and CND for long text formats accepted in order to facilitate the reuse of such publications. Another requirement is the requirement to provide information via the repository about any research output tool or instrument that is needed to validate the conclusions of the scientific publication. This is linked to the emphasis we are putting in the reproducibility of the results. And metadata must be open under a Creative Commons public domain dedication or equivalent in line with the FAIR principles and provide information about a set 
uh, of requirements, including licensing terms and persistent identifiers. A few notes, additional notes with regard to open access to publications, beneficiaries or authors, depending on the national copyright legislation, must retain sufficient IPRs to comply with the open access requirements. They will have to ensure that they keep enough IPRs to comply with what I presented before, the, the position immediate open access via the repository and their open licenses. Publication can be in the venue of their choice, but publication fees are only reimbursable if publishing in a venue in which all content is openly accessible to all. Publication fees in hybrid venues, those venues in which part of the content is openly accessible to all, but part of the content is closed, are not reimbursed. Let me clarify that uh, our beneficiaries can publish in such venues, but they will have uh, to find alternative funding sources, waiver from the publishers. So those publication fees in hybrid venues are not reimbursable, but our beneficiaries can publish there if so they wish. And also just to flag that we have the uh, Open Research Europe publishing platform, the European Commission Open Access Publishing Platform at the disposal of our beneficiaries with the possibility to publish at no cost for them, for the beneficiaries, and of course, meeting all the requirements of price view by publishing them. With regard to research data management, the focus now is on the research data management and the obligation to beneficiaries must manage the digital research data generated in the action responsibly in line with the FAIR principle. They will have to establish and regularly update a DMP for generated and uncollected data. As soon as possible and within the deadline set out in the DMP, they will have to deposit the data in a trusted repository, federated in the European Open Science Cloud, if so required in the call conditions, and ensure open access to it under CC BY public domain dedication or equivalent, following the principle as open as possible, as close as necessary. As I mentioned before, this principle accounts for the exceptions that we allow, legitimate interest constraints, so there are a set of exceptions uh, in the Horizon Europe regulation and also uh, explaining the annotated grant agreement. They will have to provide information via the repository about any research output tool and instrument needed to reuse or validate the data. And metadata must be open to the extent this is the difference with regard to the metadata of publications. There are not exceptions, it has to be open with regard to the metadata of research data to the extent legitimate interest or constraints are safeguarded and in line with the fair principles and provide information about a certain number of elements. The concept of trusted repositories, which is new under Horizon Europe. So trusted repositories are either certified repositories and or disciplinary domain repositories that are commonly used and endorsed by the research communities. They can be general purpose repositories and institutional repositories, which in general are also acceptable. And this, Trusted repositories share some essential properties, such as the mechanisms to ensure integrity and authenticity of contents, offering clear information about their policies and services, providing broad and ideally open access to content, assigning persistent identifiers, asking for detailed metadata mm -hmm. in a standardized mm -hmm. and machine readable way, ensuring mid and long term preservation of contents, expropriation and quality assurance, and meeting national and international security criteria. Just very One brief. minute, Ali, I'm sorry. Yes, to point out uh, that we have other provisions on additional open science practices, which are mandatory, that may come from the call conditions, and then also regarding the validation of scientific publications and provided digital or physical access to the results needed to validate, to the extent that the legitimate interest of constraints are safeguarded, and also in the case of public emergencies. With regard to the validation of publications and public emergencies, those have been included in the general annexes of the main Horizon Europe work program and though, therefore are applicable to all these calls under that work program. And that's it. So thank you very much. Here you have the links to some guidance and resources on open science in Horizon Europe and also to the webinars in which we have explained uh, those requirements. So many thanks. Thanks a lot, Alia. I will, I'll ask you one question, which uh, was already in the in which I found in the chat. So, um, when there's a, in the proposal a list of publications of software, 
and uh, it should be provided with a qualitative assessment, this, uh, this list of publication software, and what is included or can be understood under qualitative assessment. Yes, yeah, so there I would say that our proposal should make an effort in saying uh, why uh, that uh, publication is of quality and relevant and not only relying in the journal impact factor. So not by saying uh, I have published in such venue which has a, a journal impact factor, I take for granted that is of quality and of value. So they should elaborate on that, on the impact, on the quality, on how that publication contributed to advancing the research field and elaborate on that assessment on the basis of what they understand should be the quality of such publication. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Alia. Um, for the other questions, as a, I uh, propose to, to ask them in the breakout sessions and to talk about in the breakout sessions. Now, okay. I'll move, thanks a lot, Alia. Um, now we move uh, to uh, Dagmar Meyer, who is uh, responsible, who knows a lot about open science and the ERC. Um, of course, uh, they're the same open science requirements uh, because it's in Horizon Europe, ERC falls uh, under Horizon Europe, it's the same, but there are some uh, things to add there, Dagmar, and I leave it up to you to tell us more about that. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm trying to make my screen visible. I have a new laptop. It doesn't always behave as it should. Let's see. Let's see your screen. And you have uh, seven minutes. Thank you. Yes. No. Oh, now we don't see anything. Now you do? No. Nope. We so don't see it in the present. Yeah, now we do. But there are still black boxes there. Yes, I tried to remove them. Um, yeah, the black boxes are always a bit of a problem with Zoom, but um, I hope you can okay. still kind of um, grasp the content. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here about um, uh, some of the specificities, very few of, of the ERC program as part of Horizon Europe. So um, I will jump straight into it as I'm conscious of time. Um, so uh, I will follow the same order as Alea did in her presentation. So I'll start with the question of uh, to what extent open science is, um, uh, plays a role in the proposal preparation and the evaluation process for ERC grants. And there uh, the approach is somewhat different. Namely, there is no explicit evaluation of open science practices for ERC grants, or ERC proposals. And uh, consequentially, uh, there is then also no requirement to describe open science practices in any explicit or separate way in the proposal. Now, I do want to stress here that this does not mean that the ERC does not uh, value open science practices or does not um, uh, believe that open science um, is essentially when it is, uh, when it's properly understood, open science is good science and high quality science. And this is exactly why um, uh, rather than, than having this uh, as a separate element in the proposal and in the evaluation, this is evaluated in an integrated form uh, to the extent where open science practices actually do contribute to improving the quality of the research design and methodology as they should, as we all understand then obviously this will implicitly have a positive effect on the assessment under the scientific excellence criterion, which as you know, is the only criterion for um, ERC grants. We don't have the impact and the um, implementation criteria. So um, it's just as different approach, but um, ultimately it does not um, mean that um, open science would be valued any less in ERC grants or proposals than in, in other horizon proposals. Um, I'd also like to point out or, or draw your attention to the fact that in July, the ERC formally endorsed the uh, DORA declaration in line with its long time commitment to research assessment principles that actually do recognize the intrinsic quality of a researchers work and the value and impact of all kinds of research outputs. So um, contrary to what some people claim, the ERC does not just look at um, how many publications in prestigious, glamorous journals with a high impact factor, the, the opposite is actually the case. 
Um, so the endorsement of DORA um, led to some small changes in the 2022 uh, work program of the ERC. Um, only small changes because since the design stage of the ERC program already um, uh, the, the, the ERC um, funding scheme and including the evaluation process and, and um, also the, the proposal requirements have already always been quite closely aligned with the DORA principles. So a few small changes were introduced in the latest work program. First of all, it has been made more explicit and visible that um, applicants are really invited to include any kind of scientific achievement that they deem relevant for their project, for their research field, for the specific work they um, want to put forward. Um, and so there is a closed list in the track record section of the application form, but it has now been made clearer and more obvious that if there is anything that is not on the list, um, applicants are welcome to put it forward as if they can explain why it is important for the specific proposal and, and the work they want to carry out. Journal impact factors have been banned. However, other well-justified um, uh, field relevant bibliometric indicators may be included, but these would naturally then not include journal-based impact factors, but could be um, uh, bibliometric indicators uh, based on the individual contribution that the researcher has made. Um, there's also now a reminder that applicants can include a short narrative describing the scientific importance of the outputs they're putting forward and the specific role played by the applicant in their produ uh, production, therefore explaining um, why it actually makes sense that these uh, outputs are included in the track record and why this should be valued for the specific proposal. This was already possible before, but it has now been put again in writing that um, applicants may include such a short narrative. And preprints have been in, invited to be included in the track record already since the work program 2019. And uh, preprints are, of course, now a very hot topic of discussion. So um, I've just included this here as a re reminder. In terms of the model grant agreement, there is really um, nothing much to add to what uh, Alea already said, because um, the, the, uh, the model grant agreement as it is used for the ERC grants, as far as open science, the open science section is concerned is exactly the same. There's no difference in wording, no difference in the interpretation of that wording. But um, of course, there are some sections, some, some requirements, let's say, that are conditional. In other words, they will only be applicable if and when they are triggered in the specific call conditions or in the work program. And that includes the two that um, Alea already referred to, the one related to the validation of scientific publications and the other one related to public emergency, um, where the scientific council um, has decided not to trigger them in the current work program. Um, and uh, that was a very uh, much debated decision. So, um, this is uh, decided from year to year, and it might very well happen that maybe in the future the decision will be otherwise. But in any case, this is already uh, left as an option in the model grant agreement. So uh, as far as the MGA is concerned, there are really no differences for the ERC anymore in the area of open science. A few words on uh, ERC uh, support to recommended repositories. The ERC Scientific Council has recommended three very specific repositories, Europe PubMed Central for the Life Sciences, Archive for the PE domain, Physical Sciences and Engineering, and the OAPEN Open Books Library for books and chapters, which are particularly important for the social sciences and humanities, the SH domain. All three of them have received or are receiving ERC funding to varying uh, amounts and durations. Um, and the idea here is that these are heavily used by ERC grantees. Um, Europe PubMed Central and the OAPEN library can actually only be used by ERC grantees, not by other Horizon Europe grantees, at least not to the extent of uploading um, manuscripts themselves. Their, their publications may make it into Europe PMC uh, through other channels, uploaded by publishers, et cetera. But actually, um, 
to actively uh, deposit as a researcher, this is only possible under, uh, among the Horizon Europe grantees, it's only possible for ERC grantees. So I wanted to include this here because it is something ERC specific. And I also want to stress that EuroPMC and the OAPEN library are actually already very good in terms of the metadata that they um, allow grantees or authors to, to encode um, very closely aligned to what is required under Horizon Europe. Archive is still a bit further away and this is exactly why the ERC decided to give a small grant to help archives to update their metadata um, provisions. And of course that will be beneficial to all authors, not only to ERC grantees. Um, there are a few references that you may find interesting. First of all, the Open Sciences page on the ERC website has recently been completely overhauled and is now updated, including everything related to Horizon Europe, including step-by-step -step, um, guidance. There is also an information document by the Scientific Council on Open Research Data and Data Management Plans, which has also been very much um, updated with with including now the new requirements under Horizon Europe. And there will be additional ERC specific guidance later on, which is currently still in preparation. Um, finally, there's also an ERC document in the DORA resource library related to um, how the ERC um, actually ensures that its uh, evaluation procedures are in line with the DORA principles. So that could also be of interest. And um, if you have any questions, then of course, uh, feel free to ask them now. And otherwise you can always contact us also at this um, functional email. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Dagmar. Uh, and yes, Esther, uh, we will provide you with a link to the slide so you can have all the links there and all the information at hand. Um, so that is, a, that is not a problem. Um, I have, I'm afraid we have to move on, uh, looking at time. Uh, certainly keep your questions for the breakout uh, breakouts that we might have to shorten a bit, but Emily, um, uh, if I leave the floor to you, you can share your screen, but maybe uh, you can make it a bit shorter, uh, more five to six minutes if yes. possible. And I'll Emily Adamons is my colleague from Ghent University. Uh, she has worked uh, with me on uh, open air projects and then uh, in ESC pillar, for example, and will tell us more on how uh, we uh, translate these open science requirements for our researchers in Ghent University. Emily, floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, I hope everybody can see my screen and there are no black boxes. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so after this uh, lovely presentation of the mandate, I'll go into the practical steps that Ghent University took to translate this uh, mandate into training material, because of course there are some challenges in uh, translating these documents to a qualitative and practical guide for uh, researchers. So there's uh, the challenge of making this really a concise and practical guide that researchers can so consult easily. Um, and uh, another challenge that we had was to align internally about what pr best practices we would promote and if there were any ambig ambiguities uh, to clarify them amongst ourselves before we would uh, provide this information to researchers. We also had to move fast the first calls are already out there and so we moved over the uh, we worked over the summer of course we were not unprepared we knew this was coming so as fast as we had all the material we started working and we had to be flexible because we know from um, previous years that there might be updates but also that we will have more insights as long as uh, horizon europe will come forth so there were some advantages I think we had in Ghent University, so some things we did that really helped us. The first uh, was, was collaboration. So at Ghent University we have an uh, EU team which is specialized in EU grants. It gives all around support for EU uh, projects, so not only uh, help, does it help with proposal writing, but also after a grant it helps with, all, uh, the, with the whole project. So they have a lot of expertise and that was combined with the expertise of the open science team in the library. 
Um, the Open Science team also have, has a lot of expertise on open science regulation, not only on the EU level, but also national and institutional um, open science mandates. So we know how to uh, translate those kind of information. And we have some experience with uh, developing training material because we're also uh, involved, for example, in projects like Open Air. The Open Science team also includes a data steward team team and that was really uh, fundamental and very helpful in all the um, um, in the um, data uh, management uh, requirements but because we could uh, combine this expertise we could uh, move fast and align our research resources and our time uh, the EU team provides us with quick access to all relevant information and we could cross check really fast uh, between the two uh, teams to make this into a practical guide. The next thing that really helped us was agi agility. Um, so we decided to use the tools that were already available to us in our university, because that would exclude the time to learning a new tool and also to communicate this new tool to researchers. The tools that we used are already well known in our university and another important thing with these tools is that we can adapt them ourselves so we can move quickly. So uh, in practice, this means that we use two tools, uh, research tips, which is, which is a Ghent University specific tool, which we use for all practical uh, information uh, to communicate with our researchers. And it, it works a little bit like F, um, FIQ where we always have a keyword and uh, then a question. It's really fine grained. You can, you can uh, look up uh, things with keywords or teams and we can adapt it ourselves. Um, so that's, uh, that was one of the things that we uh, thought of immediately. It's also well known by researchers. Uh, we try to reference it as much as possible so that we don't have to duplicate work at the moment, we have a couple of tips on Horizon Europe. Of course, we have an overview tip of all the open science requirements and then specific tips on proposal writer, writing, open access to publication and research data management, and a tip on the recommended open science practices. Within those tips, there are links to other tips. So if researchers are not familiar with, kind, with certain concepts, they can click through to uh, the other tips. Another tool that we have available at Ghent University is DMP Online, of course, a well-known tool from DCC, but we have a local instance of that, uh, which means that we can adapt it very click quickly. So we uploaded the template uh, for Horizon Europe in our tool, and we had the uh, opportunity or the, because it's a local instance, we could add local support. So there's a direct, direct link to our uh, RDM support team, and we can add institutional specific guidelines so that researchers know where to go within the uh, university. There's interaction between those two tools. We uh, gather information from DMP online and question that we receive through our support system, which we can feed into the research tip and uh, vice versa. So it is really helpful for us to know where uh, possible questions are. Uh, with regards to the mandate. So in short, what we learned is no one size fits all. With the proposal writer, we actually started uh, with um, trying to write a document that would give tips uh, for proposal writer. And very quickly, we uh, realized that uh, it was very difficult because projects are um, so specific that it was better to have general tips and then specific uh, help if needed. We uh, moved fast because we could collaborate and pool our expertise uh, on research data management, on proposal writer, writing, on open science. We anticipated, we knew the mandate was coming, and we use an adaptable format. So if things change, we can change our guidance as well. And for all the people that are looking for material, I would say don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of universities and a lot of projects who are at the moment busy uh, translating this uh, mandate into practical tools into uh, training material and so on 
So be sure to have a, a, a look at uh, these projects. So that's really quickly what we did at Kent University. If there's any questions, feel free. And I think we can move to the next presentation. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot, Emily. Uh, so we, we that uh, in Kent University, this is a nice overview of how we try to combine and interact different tools uh, so that uh, it's uh, more uh, easy for researchers. Thanks a lot, Emily. Um, uh, maybe you can unshare your screen and then we can uh, move on to Ellen uh, Lehnert uh, from uh, DANS and uh, the shock community who will talk about open science and RDM community building and support activities. Um, and uh, I would ask Ellen to share her screen and uh, you have uh, well, five to six minutes if possible, Ellen. Yes, well, um, do you see my screen? Uh, yes, I see it. Okay, so um, I will I will try to keep it much shorter because the slides are shared and I think the story is not. Uh, I can I can um, make sure that we uh, we have an, uh, more time for the breakout. So first of all, I will I will not uh, say so much about shock because I did already in two other <laughs> workshops of the community of practice, and I would like to focus on on dance as a as a data archive and how we um, have been supporting open science and uh, research data management community building. Um, First of all, uh, with the help of uh, of uh, Emily, I, I, I added this slide with, with in short, um, the topics that um, we are all working on. And I um, say from the dance uh, perspective, we are more uh, working on the research data management guidance in general, and uh, we have not focused on Horizon Europe yet. So that's, I think, very, uh, we need to, I need to be clear about that. But one of the things that needs to be done is that you store your data in a trusted repository, and that's something, for example, that uh, Dance is very keen on, and um, we are um, part of the Core Trust Seal. Uh, community and have a certified uh, seal for our uh, archive um, that's just renewed um, so because you always have it for three years so that's I think uh, good news for us and for everyone who wants to deposit data at our archive. Now the rest of the slides is uh, where Dans was involved in uh, supporting research data management and um, open science. And I will go through them quite quickly because they include links and you can um, read about it a bit more. Uh, Research Data Netherlands is a cooperation of 4TU, Dans and SurfSara. We offer uh, training uh, for data supporters. Uh, there is the Essentials for Data Support that you might know. It's uh, uh, online available. The course content is online available. Uh, so, uh, but we also offer a blended course, which is partly uh, online pre preparation and partly face-to-face. -face. Uh, there is a new uh, course on GDPR um, that we have now, uh, we will run the second pilot in a couple of weeks. And uh, it uh, is also supposed to run uh, three times a year, but then not as a pilot anymore starting uh, next year. And there is the MOOC that uh, was created um, uh, with um, the DCC and the Edinburgh uh, University delivering RDM services. It's running now at the moment, and it's also more or less three times a year running. So I'm not saying it always is like that. Then we were involved in the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide. This is for researchers and mainly for social sciences. Um, uh, it follows the research data life cycle. It has now seven chapters and uh, it's regularly updated. So um, you can have a look there if you would like uh, to have um, more general support on research data management and data management planning. Now the upcoming, uh, uh, just mentioning also events that uh, SESTA is organizing and uh, we are part of SESTA. Um, 
but anyhow, uh, there is one coming up next week on research data management and data protection on social sciences data. Then in the open air advanced project that is now of course over, a lot of uh, support materials have been created. Um, of course, this was not uh, with her, um, Horizon Europe, but with um, Horizon um, 2020 in our focus. Uh, but there are very, uh, there are a lot of general uh, documents and general uh, guidances that uh, are still applicable. So I think it would be good to check that out. Um, I would like to uh, point out in the upper right corner, there's a list of Horizon 2020 DMPs. This could be inspiring for, um, for some and um, so these were the openly available uh, DMPs uh, at that time, which is, uh, I think, around a year ago. It's published uh, by um, by one of the members of the Open Air partners in Open Air Advance. There are links uh, on all these guidances. Um, but with regard to shock, we had some uh, train the trainer boot camps. It was not specifically targeting open science, but it had all kinds of research data management uh, topics like costing of managing data, which is, I think, interesting. Uh, we had uh, that particular part was um, 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 uh, from trainers from uh, DCC. And um, yeah, let's move on because otherwise you don't have enough. There is a training discovery toolkit with references to, to um, uh, training materials that a creation team of the shock project um, uh, find valuable. So let's uh, put an, 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 an image here of the, the, the available uh, uh, games, um, yeah, mainly on the topic of uh, open access, open science and research data management. Maybe you want to check that out. Um, I think this is not that relevant anymore. Yeah, I thought that uh, colleague Helen Clare uh, presented yesterday from the EOSC Synergy project, the, um, the handbook um, that uh, the Open Science Online Training Handbook that can still be um, viewed uh, and commented. So I added the slide here and they also have a, an eight module course available on research data management, fair data and open science. Um, and Dantas is also involved in EOS Synergy. But I think it's good to mention. Um, the, from the fair is fair project, uh, there is a, a, another a teaching and training handbook uh, coming available in the, in the upcoming months. Deliverable is due in December. It was just uh, and another um, and a tool for. <laughs> I'm going really fast, so that's why I'm blah, blah, blah. and a tool for researchers uh, to assess how fair their data set is. Is a fair aware tool. You can find it here, and uh, there is um, some people from from dance have worked uh, on the guidance that Science Europe created for reviewing data management plan, uh, which had this evaluation rubric where Ghent University worked on as well. Anyhow, then there is the open science communities for those that don't know this. Uh, we are not involved dance, but I thought we should mention it if it's a trainer trainer. <laughs> uh, so there is at least a link there. And um, that was it for my part. Thanks a lot, Alan. As always, very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive uh, what, what you uh, are doing at Dance and the projects you're involved in and, and, and the great material coming out. Um, now, uh, as, uh, as said, the slides will be shared so you will have all the links available uh, to, to look at uh, all the material that we presented uh, in this presentation. But now, without uh, further ado, we will go out to the breakout sessions because we know there are many questions and, and, and details that we want to work out regarding open access to publications, regarding research data management, and uh, regarding uh, open science at proposal stage. 
So we have three breakout uh, groups. Uh, you can choose the, the group uh, you want to join. So breakout one is on open access, breakout two is on research data management, and breakout three is on open science and the evaluation of proposals. Um, we will shorten the breakout with five minutes uh, because we are a bit over time. So we'll uh, go back to this main room in 25 minutes. And from each of the breakouts, we will just have a, a minute or two minutes that we will uh, tackle the most urgent uh, questions, but um, notes will be shared. Okay, Irina, I uh, would say do your magic <laughs> so that we can all go to breakout groups. Do you have to add something uh, to this on how we go to breakout groups? Yeah, if you click on the breakout rooms in your Zoom, you should see three rooms. Uh, and as Inga said, the first one is open access to publications with uh, Inga and Alir. Then the next one is on RDM with uh, Dagmar, Emily, and um, Ellen, uh, and uh, the last one is on uh, open science in the evaluation of Horizon Europe proposals, and uh, that's uh, Victoria and me, and uh, see you there in a minute, and uh, if you have some difficulties, please speak up and I'll, I'll send you to the room you want to get to. Thanks, Irina. And we'll see each other in 25 minutes in the main room. Uh, there was a there was a confusion uh, by someone uh, with the open access in, uh, in in Horizon Europe. Is it only gold open access? No, of course not. It's first of all green. You have to self archive in a repository, as Alia uh, also mentioned. Um, so uh, green is is the important thing. Self archiving in repository. And, and then there was uh, the question on trusted repositories, and uh, uh, Alia said, well, uh, it has to be a trusted repository or a disciplinary uh, one or an institutional one. Uh, so these are the repositories that are accepted. And please uh, do uh, uh, correct me, Alia, if I say something wrong. Yes, a, a certified repository and or a discipline or community and those repository that meets those characteristics are considered to be trusted repositories. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the last one that I want to mention is a, a question of transformative agreement. As Alia said, a hybrid is not eligible uh, uh, in the budget. Uh, and this means that transformative agreements are not eligible uh, either because that is hybrid. And that's in short uh, a few uh, questions that were answered in, the, in that small breakout. But I leave the floor now to breakout two, which is RDM, uh, which are the main things that we have to mention on RDM in Horizon Europe. Um, okay, I'll take it, Ellen, if you have, or Dachmar, if you have anything to add, feel free. So uh, we started with questions from the audience, there were quite a lot. And I think we can say that uh, in regards to RDM, uh, we see that, of course, the uh, guidelines and the mandate of Horizon Europe are quite ambitious. They're in line with what uh, Horizon 2020 had already set up. And a lot of the questions were in regards to, OK, um, what is already in place to meet those demands and to meet uh, those standards of Horizon Europe. So there were questions about repositories, um, what um, uh, repositories are acceptable, um, because there was uh, this mention of a certif certified repository, uh, but this also means that if they uh, fulfill the basic requirements to that repository, uh, that uh, a repository can be used as well. So um, another question about repositories was that um, with regards to FAIR, FAIR data, uh, maybe a repository in some of those aspects of FAIR is more important than the data itself, for example, interoperability. So again, there the question was what repositories can uh, we use or are recommended that we make sure that our data is uploaded in a repository that meets all those standards. And there were some um, tips uh, on, on uh, how to look for a repository and what are good repositories. Then another set of questions, I think, was on uh, guidance and uh, help and where to find or uh, tips on where to find guidance and help and uh, also with regards to reviewing DMPs. 
So one, I think uh, she might have been a researcher. So her experience was that uh, managing data is something that's uh, often done in the beginning and the end of the project. And of course, uh, that's a bit, uh, sometimes that makes it a bit difficult uh, because in, if you are at the end with your uh, data set and you have to upload it, then you might have forgotten some things. So she suggested a timeline and we discussed it, that idea and um, that it would be good that recommendations do include some kind of timeline that we do stress that the DMP is a living document that should be updated and also that it should be the researchers themselves, not some um, other uh, separate group that sees this as an administrative task, but that it's really incorporated in this uh, research practice. So that was something that came out of that. And then there was a quick question about what were the challenges uh, that we could see when we were um, reviewing DMPs. And there we, uh, we had some data managers uh, in our group, so that was really helpful, which stressed that uh, indeed uh, it is seen as a living document and that it is evaluated quite uh, thoroughly. So it's um, really no use to try to provide standardized answers. It's really project and data specific. I think that were the most uh, pressing issues in our group. Ellen, did I forget anything? Or Dagmar, do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe just, um, I mean, you, you said it, but I think it is really important to stress um, for the repositories, on the one hand, they have to be um, uh, trusted. And there, um, the same question apparently also came up with the, in, the, in the group on, the, on open access. So um, an institutional repository is not automatically accepted. It has to fulfill the requirements for trust repositories. Um, but the second condition, which is not a condition on the repository, but um, the, the grantees need to provide all kinds of metadata. And if the repository is not capable of, doesn't, doesn't actually offer these metadata fields, then the authors will have a problem. So it might be a trusted repository, it might be the best repository in the, <clears throat> in the community, but if it doesn't have those metadata fields, the grantee will not be able to co comply with the um, grant agreement. So I think that's important to point out um, it's not, these are two different criteria. Metadata requirements is one criteria, is one set of criteria and trusted is a different set of criteria. It's not the same. Thank you for clarifying that, Eichmann. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for that feedback. And now a short feedback from breakout three where uh, the open science and the proposal writing was discussed. Uh, I don't know who will say something. Irina or Victoria? Yeah, just we, 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 we discuss so much. Uh, so basically, everyone was, was raising current issues that, that the Ryan Wells exchange information on, uh, on the guides um, that already exist and uh, could be reused. Uh, uh, Elena prepared a guide in Italian and she said that it will be available um, in English as well. And um, let me put a link for everyone to our shared notes. Uh, we also agreed on some, uh, some actions that are building on what you just discussed about trusted repositories and um, allowing for specific metadata fields and uh, metadata licensing uh, that might be an action for open air, Ferris Fair project and other EOSC and open science related projects to, to support institutional repositories to become uh, those kind of trusted repositories. Uh, and then another action that will uh, take us open air is um, there is a need for Good practice examples how exactly to describe uh, open science practices because there is a requirement that they they shouldn't be generic they should be specific uh, and then like how how specific you could be when there is this uh, limit of characters uh, so we'll try to collect uh, some examples of this kind of open science practices from um, proposals that have be been submitted tomorrow basically if they agree to share those parts and uh, we'll uh, we'll release them as Open the license collection of, of resources and um, 
Open Air will be working on uh, support materials for Horizon Europe. Uh, so if, if you want to be part of this endeavor, please um, say so. And uh, again, thanks a lot for sharing your, your guides and materials, Esther. That's also useful. Um, so that, that's a quick summary. And uh, there are lots yeah. of details. And, and uh, maybe to flag that uh, it's not mandatory to publish in Open Research Europe. Uh, it's a good practice, but it's, it's not required. Sir. And Zenodo is a trusted repository. Yeah, there are lots of things uh, discussed here, and uh, for the people who are here, and I can certainly speak uh, for, for ourselves, this information helps us to better guide our researchers and answer questions, and uh, this information will help us all to, uh, to improve the, the support that we give to our researchers. Now we're eight minutes over schedule, so sorry about that, uh, but uh, I'm happy you all stayed here that long. I hope uh, the workshop was indeed very useful for you. In uh, 20 minutes, so 11.30, the lightning talks uh, start. I hope you will enjoy that session as well. Uh, as you know, we have one other session this afternoon and then uh, tomorrow afternoon and then the Open Science Fair uh, ends tomorrow afternoon. I'm looking forward to a live one again, hopefully in, the, in about two years. Um, but now I'm happy to have seen some of you uh, on screen. Have a nice day and enjoy uh, the next sessions uh, of the Open Science Fair. Goodbye. Yeah, thank, thank you a lot, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.